I want to ask you a few questions this morning, and I want to just ask you just to think a little bit around the idea of doubting. Has there been moments in your life, in your walk with God, that you have doubted God, really, really doubted Him? You've asked the question, Father, I have served you for so long, I believe in you, but it seems that you just don't hear my prayer. Father, my situation is dire, whatever that might be. How is it possible that your child would be treated in this way? And all those kind of questions war against your heart. And eventually you sit down and say, is this Christianity thing real? Right off the top, I want to say that many of us are at various stages of our spiritual walk with God. And more so in our intensity in our belief. And there are times when you are kind of riding the crest of the wave. And I imagine myself as a surfboarder, just riding the wave and running one of these very big waves and <coughs> getting out there, feeling the hair, the, the wind through my hair and, <coughs> and just going great. And then I see myself as the guy that gets plunged and gets rolled and uh, coming off the board and everything just goes wrong and you now trying to get air, trying to get out from under the waves, and you just get pummeled by the power of the, the situation that surrounds you. I think many of us felt that way before. And sometimes maybe at this moment, that's exactly where you are. You're kind of sitting there and you're saying, I believe in this Jesus thing, and that's why I'm here. But boy, am I struggling. Am I struggling to make sense of life? I look at my family, I look at my mom that's got cancer, I look at a friend of mine that's struggling with bipolar, trying to make sense of life, and yet I find the gross unfairness. I see people that live righteous lives being treated like dogs, and those who are ungodly are held on their hands. How is it possible that that could happen in today's day and age? And all those kind of thinking goes against our heart, and we ask the question again, What's this Christianity thing all about? And we do the most cardinal thing of sins and we blame God for all of this. Let me say this to you. Satan's playing with you. Satan's playing with you the greatest game and all that he does is what he did way back in the Garden of Eden. He just plants the seed of doubt. And maybe today you're sitting and I'm saying I'm giving God one chance. I'm giving him one chance to redeem himself in my life. And if he fails, I'm going to walk away. Let me tell you a story many years ago of a man. I was in Benoni Church and I met him. He he walked in and I saw him as he walked in. And after worship service, he left the building. And something about this man caught my eye. He went to stand in the sun against the white wall as you come out of the Benoni front building. And he stood there for a while. I went across and I said to him, can I introduce myself? He said, yes. He said, my name's Derek. What's your name? Joe. And we started to talk about good things. We spoke about God. We spoke about his family. We spoke about where he is. And soon I realized this guy's got an American accent, and I didn't care really. But we started to talk, and I said to him, Joe, what do you do? He says, I work on computers and this and that, and I'm out in contract with FNB and And eventually he said to me, it was nice meeting you. He smiled. And I said, I don't often get that kind of reaction, but it's nice meeting you too. And off he went, and I went home and had lunch and so on. About three years later, my wife and I were leaving Sabs, and Joe hosted a lunch that day. And as we were talking, Joe got up, and he very rarely spoke. He was not a very public kind of guy. And he said, that particular day, I stood there and I said, God, I'm giving you one chance to indicate that I belong here. And I went to greet him, and he says, that was my indication that God wanted me here. And when we were alone, I asked him, I said, what if God didn't come through for you that day? Would you still walk away? Now, I'm trying to talk about that nexus where you walk away or you don't believe because of that point. It's immaterial what he answered. But the key area I want to ask you and pretty much deal with this morning, that Satan is constantly working your case, 
in situations, in circumstances, in your thoughts, in your ideas, and in your behavior, and he's trying to pry out the central core of your belief system, and he's working you, and he's working the angle. I don't know if you've ever watched wrestling matches many years ago. I mean, I used to watch men like Jan Wilkins, my absolute hero. I used to get my weekly therapy by watching him pummel people, but it was absolutely wonderful to watch him. And what Jan Wilkins used to do, he used to stand and he grabs the guy, and then they identify that he's got a, maybe a limp on his left leg or whatever the case is, and they just work that leg. They just work that leg. And it's very much with Satan. He just watches you and he says, ah, you got a little bit of a limp, and then he works you on that. And that becomes his way into your heart. But I'm going to deal just with a few things that causes us to doubt. And the first one is that I believe my own reasoning sometimes brings doubt into my own mind. Human reasoning causes me to reason my way out of belief in God. I want to say this to you, that there is a massive difference between human reasoning and revelation from God. And that is the difference between your and my thinking and God's revelation of His Word. And you need to, right off the bat, make it clear in your head that there is a difference between what God has to say and what I am reasoning here. And that there is a massive divide in God's understanding and my understanding of that world. And sometimes we judge God by our limited view of who He is or our little perspective of who He is, and that colors the way that we view God. Be careful, be careful, be prayerful, be prayerful when you lean on your own understanding. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, where's the wise man of this age? Where's the learned man of this age? We find Paul speaks later on in Philippians and he makes the statement. He says, I am a Jew of the Jews. He says, a Hebrew that has been, been, been circumcised on the eighth day. He said, when it comes to religious righteousness, faultless. But he says, I consider everything in my life rubbished compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul would say to you, even I don't care how many degrees you have, and I've got one or two, it is rubbish by comparison in knowing who Jesus is. Knowing God's word humbles me. It puts me in my place and it helps me understand. Even Paul would say in Corinthians, he says, who, who is the carnal man that judges God? He says, but we have the spirit of God. And there's a massive difference between the two worlds of God. And so the first thing is we reason our way out of faith in God. Why did God allow this to happen to me? Do you believe that God would make such a terrible thing happen to me? And I know this is tough because we also say if God is a loving God, why does God allow so much destruction and death in this world? <coughs> it is a faith-destroying argument. And it will pummel you into a corner till to the point where you say, I give up and I walk away. C.S. Lewis said, if you examined a hundred people who have lost their faith, most would have simply reasoned themselves out of it by what they considered to be honest arguments. But in reality, their doubt was ignited and sustained by Satan. You will watch Satan will work you to try to cause doubt between you and God. In the second place, apparent unanswered prayers will cause you to doubt God. And sometimes we pray for a week, we pray for a month, we say, Lord, please let this happen. Lord, please, I ask you for answers. But you will find the greatest people that God have used have often had unanswered prayers for years. We look into the life of Joseph. We're talking 13 years. A man that hasn't touched his boss's wife, yet he was in prison for it. We find that he was unfairly accused. But he stayed focused on one thing and the fact that God had called him. And that kept him fueled. And that's why Paul would speak in Romans chapter 10. He said, he who has called you is faithful. He also says later on in the same chapter, he says the gift of God is irrevocable. In other words, God trekt dit nie terug nie. God sê nie, ja, jy is my kind vandag, en morgen sê, ek het my mind bykie gechange oor jou. What kind of rubbish is that? 
God says, my grace cannot be withdrawn. In other words, when God says, you are mine, despite your circumstances, God is faithful. And we look at these things and we often say, Ek het redig waar vir die Heere eerlijk gevra vir dit, maar die Heere sê nie, die Heere wil het vir my gee nie. Well, maybe God's saying no. Or maybe God's saying later. Does that make sense? Maybe you're not right for it at this time. Many years ago, I had a discussion with a young person that says, I'm really struggling because I've fallen in love with this guy. I said, huh? It was a young, young child. He says, do you love him? Oh, oh. Love him. And he says, is he a great guy? Oh, he's the, he's, he's the most attractive guy at school. When I see him, my world just comes to an end. I said, okay. Do you love him? Oh, I love him. How old are you? 14. <laughs> I said to her, and you, mar- you want to marry him? Oh, yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> but my parents want to hear nothing of it. 14. Maybe God's saying you're not ready for it. And sometimes in our spiritual development, God says, can, I, can you begin to imagine what it will be like if I should be sending down a 220 volt reality down your 12 volt faith? Can you imagine how it will destroy you? God is saying to you, be patient. Be faithful in prayer. My favorite passage is Daniel. A man who I love, and I, by God's grace, I wish one day I'll meet him in heaven. And I want to sit with Daniel and say to him, Dan, I want to tell you, you penned a passage that meant so much to me. Daniel had a problem. He prayed to God. And he asked God, he says, Lord, please, I need your help. About three weeks later, God sent an angel to come and see him. And in that specific moment of meeting, the angel said to him, do not be afraid. I want you to know that 365 times in the Bible, that specific phrase is repeated over and over again. And God says, don't be afraid. Don't be nervous. It's going to be okay. And Daniel gets heard this word from the angel. He says to him, Daniel, God heard you the first time you prayed. But I was delayed. I was delayed. The spiritual realm doesn't work on your and my time. You kind of walk onto the thing and say to him, Jere, give you in ear kans. Is jy nou nie opkoming as het verbeid is en ek en jy? What do you think you're busy with? An equal? You see, sometimes God views the world differently. And when you and I become a child of God, we become part of His agenda. Not yours. Not mine. And we wait for God. At the right time, He will open up things. Even Jesus had to wait. When you read the book of Galatians, He says... At the right time, God sent Jesus Christ. Did you know between Malachi and Matthew, there was 400 years of silence when no prophecy was made? But if you read those 400 years and you study the events of that 400 years of world history, you will find out that everything that was prophesied about Jesus came true during that 400 years. Faith in God and my faith in God is strengthened more by the word of God, but more so in the ultimate unraveling of God's prophecy because God knew what was going to happen when you and I could not see through time. Sometimes you need to wait 25 years. We know the story of Abram and Sarah, and on Wednesday evening, we had a blast at Bible study. Glenn observed during the Bible study, he made a comment. He says, because of Abram trying to be in a hurry with God, now he's sitting with this massive problem up in the north where these clowns want to kill each other. What is going on here? The key area is how many of those moments were there with you and I. When we ran out of patience with God and says, I'm going to do my own thing. Ek hoor nou wat jy wil hee vir my, maar I'm going to make a thing happen here because I'm a kind of guy that makes things happen. Let me warn you. You have never yet come to burn your fingers so much of trying to make things happen outside of the time frame that God has for you. Doubt is often, in the third place, fostered by religious people. Can I tell you how dangerous it is to be a Christian? And the reason for that is Jesus Christ says, If you cause even the least of these to stumble, 
I'll deal with you. Can I tell you that word of God in Luke chapter 17 strikes fear into my heart because he's saying to me, watch your behavior. Watch your behavior as a Christian because people can lose their faith, lose their trust in God because of the way that you and I conduct each other. I can tell you these following statements I've heard more times than I care to remember. He says, is this a church? I don't want to be a member of people where they gossip and slander about each other. He says, Derek, you must hear what they say about you. I said, huh? <laughs> Not interested. They did it to my Lord. They're going to do it to me. They did it to Jesus. They'll do it to you. But this is the key. It must never come from us. Does that make sense, Carol? Never from us. We must never hurt God's kingdom. Because this is his display case. My mother, many years ago, had a display case. Do, 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 you, do people still have that? Remember? The thing with the glass vibe and they got stuff behind it. Objet d'art, they call it. My wife calls them dust collectors. Very unappreciative of fine art. But anyway, <laughs> when you look at the, the things in those areas that your mother often, and I said, Mom, what is that? My mom had a little clock this big. She said, you know, Derek, that clock was given to me when I qualified as a nurse many years ago. I said, so mom, so that has great significance to you. Yeah, absolutely. On the one side, you're saying, get rid of it. She said, I can't do that. It holds emotional relevance for me. But one of the key things I want to say to you is that in the same way God's saying is that every time we misbehave or we hurt people or we say something that's inappropriate, it shoots people out the kingdom because you're God's display case. Because you continually would drive people's memory back to what they experience in the world. And they say, what's different in the world than in the church? We've got to be different. But I want to say this, this is a wonderful argument I've often heard. I don't go to church because there's too many hypocrites there. Let me tell you something today. Do you know what a hypocrite actually is? A hypocrite is somebody who is overtly evil in their hearts. And they display a kind of godliness with its intention to deceive and to mislead. I am saying this aloud publicly, that there are no hypocrites in this church. Okay? I'll tell you why. Because there is a big difference between a hypocrite and somebody that at a moment in time is weak in their faith. Does that make sense? There's a big difference. Because that person at that time does that because they are weak and their trust of God is diminished at that time. Don't call people hypocrites. There might be that some of their behavior borders on hypocrisy. And sure, but, but don't do that. It's a strong word. It's dangerous. The key is also, then you might ask the question, what about it, Derek? How do, you, how do you answer that? Let me say this to you. And I think it was a friend of mine that made a comment. He says, are you sometimes hypocritical in your behavior? And the person said, yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's always a place for one more. Probably not a nice way to answer that. The bottom line, brethren, is that we must have our faith in God. And don't look at people. People are fallible. And they will disappoint you. But don't judge Jesus by the behavior of a weak Christian at that time. Give him the grace that you also want to be given. Because there are not always, at all times, that you're on top of your game. There's times that you also struggle. There's times that you also come apart. There's times that you're also in need of the grace of God. And so often, brethren, leaders are targets of people. Don't do that. Encourage. Rather speak to people to earn and to, to improve their lives. Some doubts occur due to our own sin. And here's where we sometimes struggle. We don't sometimes walk by faith, but we genuinely struggle. And we sin. And sometimes we say that, you know what, I've sinned so badly that there is no way this loving God and this gracious God, who has a wrathful side, will accept me back. God is saying to you, is that you are human, but I am there for you. 
And so often, sometimes, we're not minimizing sin because it'll hurt you. But quickly, see the gracious God that wants you to come to Him. You must remember that salvation and your salvation is not by your goodness. It's not by your works or even about your living outside of sin at the time when God called you. But God wants you to live a life that is aware to steer your life clear of sin all the time. But when you do sin, and I'm not saying that you should, come back to God. Don't let that push you away. In the fifth place, sometimes doubt is due to our own laziness. And how much times that is the case. Jesus Christ was one of the most direct men on this planet. And at the church of Laodicea, way back in Revelation, he speaks to them and he says to them, let me tell you straight, you're lazy. Yes, lay, lay, lay. They will not work. You slap. You are parties. You are apathetic. You are low, lukewarm. You are not warm. You must warm yes. You must absolute in, in tune with me here, where you want to be a part of His grace. You want to make things happen. James will tell you a faith that doesn't work is death, dead. And then we sit down and we say, well, I've got all the faith in the world. And I said, yeah, I'm God's saying, get up and do something. Get up and do something. That's going to make this thing come together. But work within His will and within His timing. A living, growing, survival faith must be, must be exercised. I'm the perfect example of exercise. You've got to exercise. If you want to be a great baseball player, you need to be on the field, pitching and catching and hitting the ball kind of thing. If you want to be a great swimmer, you've got to be out. I want to be like Chad LeClough, get into the swimming pool 4 o'clock every morning. I personally think he's nuts. But that's the kind of price you have to pay. Does that make sense? If you want to walk close to God, you've got to exercise your faith. You've got to kind of know. <clears throat> Sunday morning, sometimes, folks, I'm, I'm, I can't see my way clear to come to worship. Really? What if you've got an eye problem? See a, see a doctor. But be at worship. Be at Bible studies. Go through the Bible. I can tell you now there are times that I must drag myself from my bedroom to the kitchen to have a meal. Do you do that? No, I don't. Now, that comes naturally. <laughs> In the same way God's saying, build it into your DNA that you could feel energized to be with God's people. Sometimes we are just too lazy. To switch the television off when there are immoral things on the television. And then sometimes we say, but, but, but it's not about that. It's about the storyline. Really? I remember many years ago, um, I think there was a Scope magazine was out those years. I don't know if you remember the early days of this kind of stuff going around. And I was at school many years ago. And we had a wonderful teacher. A very strict guy, Mr. Fasahi. And the guys were sitting in the back of the classroom. And funny enough, they were not the very bright guys. They were always sitting with those kind of magazines. And he turned around, he says to the guys, um, what's going on at the back? So the guy said, well, Mr. Fasaki, we're reading. Oh, that's wonderful. I love you to read. And I'm looking at this guy, I'm like, go and check what the cats are reading, man. So he goes over there, he opens it, Mevracht, Scope magazine. So he says, guys, what is going on here? Are you guys crazy? He pulls him to the front, giving six of the best. And eventually one of the guys pipes out. He says, Mr. Fasaki, you haven't even read the stories in that book. Wonderful stories. Very informative. And he says, I tell you what, you come back for another six. <laughs> Needless to say, brethren, sometimes we need to know where to draw the line. Be sharp. Be sharp. Be diligent. Be diligent in your walk with God. Be diligent in the know, the knowledge that you need to acquire to make a proper decision when it comes to decision-making time. In the sixth place, sometimes doubt flourish because we fail to count our blessings. We fail to count our blessings and really say, Lord, thank you for what you've provided for me. Man says, duck back for what you haven't forget me. You know, at the end of the day, brethren, we need to be grateful to God. You know, many years ago, I met a man, Bernie Manzoni. I sat with him in his house. And I said, Bern, I says, you inspire me. He looked at me very quizzically. And I said, I've never heard you complain. I really haven't. Bernie said to me, 
I'm so grateful, Derek, for every day God gives me. In fact, I'm intolerant of complaining. You see, when you are so busy complaining, you are nothing better than the prodigal son's older brother. He got back, and instead of being grateful, Lord, thank you that you brought this man back, he went to that way and said, you know what? When did you give me a calf to, to party with my friends? It's everything about me, 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 rather than being grateful to what God has given us. God replies, son, you lived in my home every day. You know that I withhold nothing from you. All of it belongs to you. And I've given you everything that you need. And the idea there is that God's saying, my word, you don't even see what I give you, what I provide for you. But you are resentful when I give the grace to someone else. God, brethren, in the narrative is a loving God. And he really wants us to enjoy having that relationship with him. And everybody else, even those that you and I feel are undeserving. Thomas, I'm just going to touch on the second part and I'm going to go through some very quick examples. I want to say the following, that sometimes you find <clears throat> that faith and doubt can live in the same heart of the same person. Way back in John chapter 11, round about verse 16, the apostles say, Jesus says to the apostles, he says to them, guys, I need to go to Judea. And the apostle says, no, 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 you can't. Because if you go back, they're going to kill you. They knew about it because Lazarus was just raised and it became apparent around about chapter 12 that these cats actually wanted to kill old Lazarus. So he turns around and Jesus says, we need to go, guys. Thomas turns around and says, let's go so that we may die with Jesus. Hey, he's dandelion, he's in there. He wants to get going. But we find later on in the passage we've just read in John chapter 20 that Thomas doubts. And sometimes, brethren, in the same person, you find that there are moments of heights of faith and deep valleys of doubt. Thomas turns around and he feels fearful. He didn't hear the first part of the story. And when he meets Jesus, he says, I won't believe until I put my finger in the wound and I put my hand in his side. And Jesus says to him, he says, Thomas, come, come. If that's what it'll require for you, come. Thomas puts his hand in and he shouts these amazing words that I love and I treasure because it depicts me at times in my life. And then he says, my Lord and my God. Lord, thank you that you meet me at my dart. And Jesus Christ says to him, because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. In other words, you are more blessed than Thomas. And then there's Peter. We know the story on the boat. <coughs> Jesus sees Peter. Rather, Peter sees Jesus. And he says, Jesus, if you tell me to come, I'll come. And we know the story that Peter eventually gets out the boat, walks toward Jesus, looks at the waves, and then he, then he starts to, 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 to sink. But the interesting thing about the story, and I've said it before, is that he was further away from the boat than to Jesus. Which tells me he had a huge amount of faith. And the only aspect he needs to get right, and needed to get right, was to keep watching Jesus, the one that has called him. Jesus saved me. Just two lessons from that. Doubt often arises when we take our focus off Jesus. In the second place, doubt robs us of greatness in the kingdom. How many of us have got little faith, but we won't step forward to actually say, I want to teach a class. I want you to take me with you to the prisons. I want you to take me with you when you go and visit the sick and the dying. I want you to teach me how to teach a Sunday school or lead a song. Or I want to be a part of even if it is changing a window or even if it is clean, cleaning a toilet or bathroom. Jesus says, don't let your faith and your doubts cause you to rob yourself of serving him. John the Baptist was a doubter and we looked at it last week where he was in the prisons and the, the darkest time of his life he turned around and he sends his disciples and he says, I want you to ask him if he's the one. And Jesus says, test my work. It's according to prophecy. 
The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cured, and the dead are raised. The gospel is preached to the poor. That's when John knew. That's the man. In the same way, you at the moment will say, Yere is irerachvar, die verlosse. And those moments, God doesn't sit and say, hey man, just stew. God says, listen, read my word. Listen of how they talk about him in prophecy and watch how his life testifies about the reality of those prophecies coming true. Just two quick lessons. Let me close. The one I want to say, if you really and truly want to get through your doubt, you need to start getting into the word of God. Brethren, let me say this to you. An hour a week is not going to cut it, eh? Or rather, five minutes. We, we basically spend about a half an hour every Sunday around the Word. There needs to be concentrated reading just of the Word. Because faith comes by reading and knowing His Word. The second thing is, doubt causes us to miss life's fulfilling moments. And that means God says, that I want you to have life to the fullest. This is not criticisms, okay? This is not sitting there, let me pick on you, no, no, no. I'm trying to talk about a reality that I live. I have to read the Word of God every day, extensively. The reason for that, brethren, is that it forms a map in my mind that when I need it, or when God shifts my thinking to recall a specific passage, I can go to that in my memory because I've stored it there. I want to say this to you very quickly. There are times when our family disappoints us. And this is just the example of John Mark and Paul. Paul, I believe, was a very vociferous evangelist, a no-nonsense kind of guy, a guy that got down to the task and he was intolerant of diversions or folk that distracted him. John Mark was a distraction to him. And he tells Mark, Mark, John Mark packs his bag, says, I'm going with you, Paul. Oh, no, you're not. You don't walk with me, my boy. Off you go. And then he goes and Barnabas gets hold of Paul. He said, listen, but you need to just reel it back. Way back in 2 Timothy, Paul calls John Mark. And he says, like all of us sometimes need to say. Get him back here. Because he's useful in what I'm trying to achieve. Sometimes because of doubt, we pull people out, we push them away, we write them off. But remember, God's working with all of us. And you might find that there's a Barnabas or a Paul that says, hey, come on. Get sidelines. Get into the main game. And maybe today that's God's call to you. You've been playing enough on the sidelines. You've been floating enough around the world, trying to figure out your head. God says, get into the game. Be humble. And maybe today you're saying, I'm not even in the game, Derek. And God's saying, get into it. Because here's where the goodness lies. And I pray this morning that God would have shifted your heart out of your doubt into that certainty that will give you that faith to say, I'm ready. <laughs>